Marcia, in reviewing your papers, the collection you've given to the university libraries, I, I see a lot of material from when you were quite young. And my curiosity is about uh, what authors, books, illustrators were you interested in when you were a child, and how did they influence your decision to become an illustrator? Well, uh, oh, you know, we used the public library a great deal when I was a child. And the, some of the usual books that were available to us then, I was growing up in Cooperstown, New York, and the Clarks uh, had charge of the library. I was just astonished when I visited it not too long ago, I mean, not too many years ago, to see that it was actually a small room about the size <laughs> of a master bedroom in mm -hmm. someone's house. It seemed enormous to me, big vaulted room. I was four, I guess. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Kate Greenaway, Caldecott, uh, Walter Crane, uh, those books were available from that library. Some very interesting German books that had uh, movable parts, very re tastefully done, in, done in brilliant colors, uh, pink, yellow, emerald green, and uh, cobalt blue. Mm -hmm. uh, those, there were, uh, uh, the, as I uh, read, uh, began to read for myself and uh, read more and more fairy tales, Howard Pyle's books I mm -hmm. adored. Uh, the, okay. the Wonder Clock and the, uh, the you know, the Men of Iron, uh, the uh, it's Robin Hood books, all of those. Uh, I loved Otto of the Silver Hand, perhaps more than any. I don't know, there's something that caught my uh, imagination about this child with the silver hand that uh, a, a brother John, he was uh, uh, protected and took care of. It was a story of, Rob of uh, robber barons mm -hmm. in uh, Germany uh, and the people caught in the cross cur currents of war always, uh, although you didn't think of it in those big terms. You thought of it in a very personal uh, way when you were a child. I, I loved that book. I loved those strong black and white illustrations. Mm -hmm. It didn't matter to me if they were colored or not. It was the, uh, it was the uh, power of the drawing. Uh, I know there was one book, uh, you know we had the Lang Fairy books, of right. course, and there, was, uh, there were some wonderful illustrations of the wild swans, and I still remember the book. It was kind of olive green cover with silver on it, and you know, and the netting holding Elisa up with the Swan Brothers mm -hmm. flying. That is an image that is so strong. My sister and I used to sit in a big armchair, a big Morris chair, and the Airedale used to sit, insist on being in there too. It was always so you'd have this great black shape there that you could lean on. And she would read to me. Uh -huh. And uh, it, was, it was our... Uh, reading was our main pleasure. Mm -hmm. uh, when I discovered children's books as art, I was quite a bit older. I was reading adult books, of course, and I was in Kingston at the time. And uh, uh, I don't know, I used to, the, the library was a, a typical Carnegie library with the, the lobby with bookshelves here and the bo new books and so forth and then a, p a periodical room on one side and the other side was all children and young people right. and I used the adult and the adult stacks were back here that you could use and the librarian used to give me a key to use a room that was full of opera scores so I could listen to the operas more intelligently on Saturday afternoon. Well, I wandered into the children's room one day and I found Lind Ward's uh, illustrations for uh, Ching Lee and the Dragons right. and The Cat Who Went to Heaven by Elizabeth Coatsworth. Mm -hmm. And th I thought they were so beautiful. They, were, they, they do stand up as still very right. lovely books. And I remember taking them home. My mother was always very much interested uh, looking at these things with me uh, because she used to paint with watercolors when she was a child and never, uh, never really developed the talent. And the librarian, uh, seeing that I was so much interested in these, would give me the key to the locked case. And in there were Edmund Dulac, Mm -hmm. and uh, Kai Nielsen, uh, Arthur Rackham. These deluxe books of that period of the late teens, early 20s that were breathtakingly beautiful to me. And uh, also I discovered uh, Dorothy Lathrop's Fairy Circus. Right. 
just enchanting little book. You know, I, uh, many people try to do fairies, but I think she oh. had a kind of hotline to the fairyland because they are uh, these little fragile, fragile creatures that, uh, you know, they, they just seemed exquisite to mm -hmm. me. And later on, when I was at college uh, here at Albany, I was taken out by, uh, I don't know whether it was one of the art teachers or uh, who, but I was taken to Dorothy Lathrop's studio. Mm -hmm. And her mother had been an animal sculptor, you know, right. and her sister. And there were the animals uh, in, in little cages that they, that uh, they were drawing. It was something like Beatrix Potter drawing from the uh, rabbits right. that she had as pets. And, you know, she was, uh, Dorothy was working on those uh, wonderful little books, uh, Who Goes There? Mm -hmm. You know, these, uh, they were exquisite. They were done with a uh, kind of carbon crayon right. uh, and beautiful black and white technique. And the snow was very soft. It was, uh, they were somewhat stylized, but they were still mm -hmm. very, very beautiful. Mm -hmm. And they, all those influenced me. Okay. Uh, I remember going down, at, uh, talking to the librarian at the uh, Albany Public uh, Library, uh, the librarian in the children's room. And she showed me some books, Snip, Snap, Snur, for example. And she told me, uh, she gave me some good advice uh, about uh, action and how important it was in a child's book. And... Uh, uh, I, I never forgot what she said. Uh, there, uh, I, I didn't see too many things, uh, there, you know, if there wasn't time or whatever. I don't recall that. But I, uh, when I, in the summers when I was at school, I studied uh, painting, and I wanted to be a painter. But this was at the end of the Depression, mm -hmm. and the chances of making a living from just painting when my superb teacher couldn't make a living. How on earth could I? And I, uh, so of course I taught for three years right. and uh, English and dramatics, which was very useful. And then I went to New York. I knew I knew nothing about books. So I went to the library and got a job at the Central Children's Room at the New York Public Library to prepare me. So. The child just glided into the immature adult, and, <laughs> uh, you know, and I found those books, of course, that had interested me as a younger child. Right. And then, uh, but the whole period filled in much more. Mm -hmm. Now, that's a, a long answer, I guess, to a simple question. But well, it uh, wasn't a simple question. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing simple. <laughs> no. Well, you've you've shown so many different styles in your illustrations. You've you've done woodcuts. You've done. Uh, almost Bruegel-esque paintings, um, you've done the fine washes, you've done gouache. How do you decide not only what tales or stories you want to illustrate or tell, but also how you match the medium to the story? Everything seems to match so beautifully. Well, a lot of these, you know, your stories you're going to tell, it's a very subjective feeling often that you have for the story, and you get to know what stories are going to be successful with children in different moods. For example, I loved Sandberg's uh, White Horse Girl and Blue Wind Boy, but you couldn't tell it at every story hour. You had mm -hmm. to have the children just the right mood to take something as delicate as that, and then it's marvelous mm -hmm. uh, because they feel the hole in the rhythm of the sea in it. Uh, and I. I loved the uh, the grim fairy tales, grim as they are. Uh, I love to tell Rapunzel right. uh, because it again is a very emotional fairy tale with uh, a release at the end that is of of, of peace and, mm -hmm. and, and and beauty. And the children would uh, I've had many children weep, you know, when she uh, when the young man is blinded and. Uh, uh, it's just desperately unhappy, and then then this joy when uh, you know, and when the tears of Rapunzel mm -hmm. uh, give him his eyesight back. I loved Anderson's fairy tales because they had so much content. They told so much more than the stories. They're very wise stories, mm -hmm. and this is an adult writer putting his uh, all his talent and his feeling 
into these stories that were written for any age. They weren't written necessarily for children. They're what read very widely in Denmark uh, mm -hmm. uh, by adults. Uh, I adored those stories, and they uh, always stayed with me. They are long to memorize if right. you, uh, you know, The Wild Swans is quite a story to memorize if you mm -hmm. memorize the whole thing. Uh, and it's a very long story to tell, and you better, uh, you know, <laughs> have it intense uh, to keep uh, children's interest going. Uh, but, you know, in uh, I, I said that I had uh, majored in English and dramatics. Well, you study a great different, a deal of different kinds of literature, mm -hmm. and your whole ambience of these things in different periods is so, you know, the Middle Ages, the, the background is so different from Victorian England or whatever. Uh, so you feel very differently about them. If you're doing a directing plays, you of course have different decor. So why not different, completely different decor and different feelings uh, about it for children's books? Uh, I did some summer theater work uh, once at the Plymouth Drama Festival, and there was a woman there who taught, um, well, she taught scene painting. What she mm -hmm. did was we were assistants and did a lot of the work, but you could learn an enormous amount right. from her. She was wonderful. Scotty, I think, I forget her first name, but it was something, something Scott. And she, uh, one of the things we worked on that summer was Petrified Forest, and she oh. conceived it in a very expressionistic set, almost like Dr. Calgary, mm -hmm. uh, where the, the counter at the bar there uh, was, would go up to a kind of point. Everything was jagged angles and slightly cockeyed, mm -hmm. and it was, it was fun to construct and paint and very interesting. Mm -hmm. Well, that was a completely different feeling she had for that than for a much more conventional set like You Can't Take It With You, mm -hmm. that we did the set for, for that too. And uh, I think that I was just used to thinking of the stories as very different. Also, there's the element of boredom. If you settle on a technique and you apply it willy-nilly to everything under the sun, right. it's, it's going, you're going to be bored stiff, and if you're bored, you're going to be stale, and everybody else is going mm -hmm. to be bored eventually. You can either go, well, when in, as you grow, you broaden to include more and more techniques, more and more feelings, more all, all kinds of things, but you always go go more deeply. Mm -hmm. But if you stay at the same level so that at 45 you're doing the same thing that you were at 25, you worry. <laughs> you become sort of an automaton? Well, uh, <laughs> some a lot of people have built their careers this way, mm -hmm. and uh, that's up to them. I think it's, uh, I don't think it's always a matter of choice. I think it's a matter of individual temperament, maybe from your genes. I don't think, uh, you know, some of these things can't be helped. Uh, it's very interesting to see that during a certain phase you were into the woodcut mode. I was studying woodcuts right. and did many uh, fine art woodcuts, uh, color woodblocks usually. And while I was doing that, I, uh, you know, I, I, when I was working in the library, uh, I was uh, put in charge of putting in shape, let's say, the old book collection. And there mm -hmm. were loads of little old chapbooks. Right in it, and they were illustrated, of course, with very crude little woodcuts or engravings, but they were rather powerful. They, uh, they weren't too individual, but I loved the, the feeling of those little books, mm -hmm. and so I decided to do uh, Dick Whittington in, with cuts. Uh, I, it was a long book, 48 pages, and I didn't know whether I could handle 96 planks of wood. Or not, so I uh, did. Uh, I did it in linoleum cuts. Right. At that time, you could get wonderful battleship linoleum, uh, and so uh, I did it there, partly in New York and partly up in the country at Alice Dalglish's uh, place in her barn uh, in uh, Connecticut. There and. Uh, you just have a very, very different feeling uh, toward certain books. For example, now, uh, I was studying uh, painting with Stuart Davis, who, uh, as a kind of, as he was a kind of an, um, an American Cubist painter, but an abstract artist, but very much um, 
very much uh, geared to what an object actually looked like. For example, mm -hmm. if you take the chair and you, you get your shapes and your angles, and the angles and the shapes all had to be interesting. Every area had to be interesting. It had to be uh, dynamic. And uh, to teach, he would, uh, we'd have a great big model stand, and we'd have, oh, 25 objects, all different shapes and things, different rhythms, different curves, all kinds of things. Mm -hmm. And then you would make your wood, your still life from that, and not necessarily realistically at all, but you'd take the shapes that something would suggest, and you'd build up your composition that all the elements would interact dynamically. Well, that was marvelous experience for training you to see the value of shape, mm -hmm. shape, space, and color. And uh, so Henry, when you, I went down there, uh, Helen Maston, who uh, was a good friend of mine, uh, I was working for her too, but had gone down there for her health down to the Virgin Islands to St. Thomas uh, the year before, and she came back telling about these white, white coral sands, right. and the beautiful little houses, coral and uh, cream and, and pink, and, uh, and the people were, handsome people. They were so dark, they were almost purple black mm -hmm. and just marvelous. Uh, and so I was, it was a visual uh, paradise when right. I got there. I had never been, I'd been to Mexico, but I hadn't been to such a semi-tropical, you know, uh, environment. And the water was, you know, beautiful turquoise, clear mm -hmm. as crystal, uh, beautiful, beautiful place. And I started to, uh, I, I went down one summer, the next summer in fact, we went over to St. John and I had bad knees at the time and putting, we went out the first night, we went out in the boat to see the phosphorescence in the water and helping the fellow uh, put the outboard motor back in the little shed, I slipped and turned my knee out so mm -hmm. badly that I was just laid up all the time. Well, I did a lot of sketching and drawing, and you know the the fishermen. Of course, the fishing is a major op occupation there. Mm -hmm. There are these wonderful kind of heavy little boats with uh, a, like a lateen sail almost, mm -hmm. and they would bring back the fish, and they'd bring back a, a, a string of these very colorful fish, you know, so mm -hmm. that I could see them and and to draw them. They were perfectly dear. Right. And that's how that happened, that I uh, got to do that and did some of those uh, in these, uh, you know, in flat colors with all these shapes. And I remember showing them to Anne Carol Moore when I went back and she was very keen on them. And uh, she said, do you, uh, have you uh, thought of using this uh, in, in a picture book? And yes, I had. And she mm -hmm. said, well, my goodness, I'd go to it. <laughs> and so I did. The colors in that book are very different than most of the colors in your other works. Well, the, they're, the, they're the locale yes. was so, it was uh, so brilliant. That's one of the things that I notice is that you, you build around the locale. Your That's artwork right. very much reflects the area, the geographic area in which you're working. It, it, it is. And for example, if you're working on uh, purple uh, fairy tales, uh, Puss in Boots, mm -hmm. Cinderella. The atmosphere or the background was uh, early, very early 18th century, late 17th century mm -hmm. France, uh, the time where when Perrault lived. And these again were stories that were all, were really written for adults, not particularly for children. Mm -hmm. And uh, but you you would have to be familiar with the uh, architecture of of the court, of, of those things. So right. so you spent a lot of time on research. Mm -hmm. And even reading research, like uh, Madame de Sévigny's uh, letters to her daughter, you know, they give you all kinds of little little hints and feeling. And, uh, uh, you know, from uh, good ballet troops, you could see how men handled their, handled their bodies and handled, when you know, when they bowed and the whole thing. It was very different from mm -hmm. uh, just you know, sketching on the street, of course. Uh, so it, 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 they had to be different. Yeah. Well, what's also interesting to me is when I look at the work that you did for Shadows, for Shadow, and 
when you look at the early drawings, everything is very rounded and sort of pale tone. And then as you move forward, everything gets more intense in the tone as well as the shape. The shapes get darker, the shapes get more angular. What made it move from being the, the more rounded, softer we to the very, very intensive <laughs> presentation? Uh, I was using sumier, you know, to uh, technique. Uh, which is? which is ground uh, Japanese or Chinese ink stick on okay. a caesurea uh, ink stone. And if you don't rub long enough, your ink is pale. Mm -hmm. But I was in a hurry to get enough ink to do it. But it's, uh, it's, it's marvelous because it's, you know, there's an endless supply for one thing. And you, you just paint freely out of your, your feelings. Some of those were done memory. Some mm -hmm. of them were done from photographs like uh, Lenny Riefenstahl's photographs for the cow. Mm -hmm. uh, they were the people didn't wear any clothes at all, and they were wrestlers mm -hmm. who would wrestle with um, ash on their bodies um, to really serving like uh, something like resin, so they mm -hmm. wouldn't slip when they wrestled. Mm -hmm. And but these magnificent creatures were fun fun to draw, and you these rounded muscles, but. Uh, a African art, the, the wood carvings, which really right. interested me very, very much, mm -hmm. uh, I consider among the most sophisticated uh, sculptures, you know, in the world, practically. The, uh, these beautiful angular uh, carvings and these, these masks, these elegant masks, very remote of the, a little a little g child, little girl, uh, would be, uh, it would be remote because she's already a spirit and mm -hmm. you can't quite get at her anymore. These things just fascinated me. Uh, I had told those stories of Sandra's from uh, Marjorie Bianco's, you know, right. uh, little white stories for little, little black stories for little white people. Mm -hmm. An amazing title, but it was what it came out as in the 30s before people were aware of uh, some certain crudities. <laughs> uh, and, but the stories were, were wonderful. I used to tell Fine Fine, for example, the buildup of mood and atmosphere in those. Well, uh, so when you're doing, you, you first you're drawing to get into a book and to loosen yourself up and mm -hmm. to wipe everything else out. And then you're drawing to, you know, more and more the things, the situations that are required by the book. When I felt I had enough of that under control, mm -hmm. then I just took um, a sheet of cardboard and black paper and a little stencil knife and began to cut freehand. Huh. Well, you see, if you'd done enough of the drawing ahead of time, you felt you free do to do that because you could do it and get an immediacy of, to the action mm -hmm. that you're held back by if you, if you uh, make a pencil drawing and then trace it and so forth, and that, all the life goes. So you try to do things. Mm -hmm. uh, the whole trick with uh, so much of the illustration that I was doing was I was coming up through the 40s and 50s. Uh, Publishers didn't have the money to do the uh, four-color process mm -hmm. illustrations so much that they do now. So almost every illustrator had to learn how to separate his work. Mm -hmm. And if you could switch your mind and think of it as, uh, this is printmaking. Right where I have to think in different tones of black and white and different textures, they're all going to interact. Uh, and you'd keep yourself alert and alert artistically doing that so that you do your drawings, then you do the separations and you would try. Sometimes I used an entirely different technique uh, in order to keep fresh, freshness. For example, stone soup was done with a pen and ink technique mm -hmm. in the originals. Uh, in the very originals in the dummy. But when I I did the separations, I used a brush line. Right. So that the thing is looks at uh, its brush uh -huh. in those, which makes just a little different, but it's just a little different feeling for the right. brush line. And uh, I've always liked to draw with uh, brushes. And that's how um, 
that's how that came to be. What, what really fascinated me in right. Shadow is to look at the collage and notice that some of the pieces were done in the, in the black paper, some were done in the very fine white tissue paper, but some were done in purple crepe paper. <laughs> All kinds of things. Yes, you, you used. used every single type of. You used about everything that came to hand, mm -hmm. but the the Japanese tissue paper that was for the smokes right. and for the shadow figures behind the dancers, and mm -hmm. for uh, you know when you had the storyteller and these little children, they're mm -hmm. dark, of course, for, except for the whites of their eyes. Uh, and you had a figure behind the storyteller that was really the kind of primitive feeling of the storyteller with mm -hmm. those white images on it that were the stories that came from, you know, animal gods right. and things. There are endless things you can read into that story. It's that, amazing. Uh, you capture it, so much in your well, stories. Well, uh, it's, uh, you know, you think of all these things. After all, you're working on these things every day, and you think of them. I often uh, letters, everything has to go by the board when you're concentrating on a book because mm -hmm. you're so concentrated, you know, night and day, you're in that book. And that seems to be the only way I can work uh, really well. I, I don't think, uh, now at this stage, I, I don't think I, c I can't do a, a five or ten things mm -hmm. and, and do it. So. Well, the, you do a lot with oral tradition and the, the folk tales, the fairy tales, that's all considered to be oral tradition and the passing on of knowledge from one generation to another. And you've translated them very successfully into books. Um, do you think that storytelling is, c with the electronic age, is it is it going to become a dying art? Are children too inured to I, I listening think to an adult or another child read to them? I think it's... Uh I don't think so, but I think it depends very much on where the children are, how sensitive the parents are to to reading to the child when he's little and uh, uh, ignoring television. Mm -hmm. uh, there's some lovely things for children have been on television, but there's uh, horrendous material, much too cruel, much too uh, uh, macabre for a little child. Mm -hmm. There's, it's from a kind of an adolescent delight and horror, which a little child, uh, it, it, it stains him, I think. It's unfortunate. But when I was, I had to go down to uh, Arkansas to speak once. And we all, uh, the people that were, uh, you know, they were librarians and teachers, so we're, we all went to dinner down mm -hmm. on uh, was like a riverboat anchored in the harbor there. And there were ch they brought their children. Well, those children, and they'd say, you know, afterwards, we're going to have stories. Uh -huh. And they were so crazy <laughs> for the stories. Uh, and uh, that was much more important to them than their dinner, than mm -hmm. ice cream, than anything, mm -hmm. was that they were going to have stories afterwards. And this uh, tradition in the South has probably meant that some of our most wonderful authors have come from the South with that, uh, that oral uh, storytelling tradition. Uh, Augustus, uh, ba Augusta Baker, uh, you know, who's a very good storyteller mm -hmm. herself, is now uh, delicate. She's very elderly and lives down in Columbia, South Carolina, uh -huh. has a, a wonderful staff of uh, librarians that she's really trained to be very good storytellers. Mm. Uh, and they, every year, they have what they call Baker's Dozen. And I was asked to be part of the Baker's Dozen this year, but I, uh, I was unable because I had this scheduled and I mm -hmm. didn't feel I could make two trips uh, close together. Uh, but they, uh, there's a big mansion in town that has a great front lawn with beautiful trees and a uh, great space of green mm -hmm. grass. They bus children in from the surrounding countryside from these little schools and four or five thousand children come there in relays, say about a hundred at a time, and there are maybe thirty storytellers 
in various places, maybe under this tree or here or here or here or here. And the children, you know, you have them all scuttle and get into little circles, and then they all hear these stories from different storytellers mm -hmm. with different point of view toward their storytelling. So there is variety, and they do that all day long. Mm -hmm. And they have a picnic there, and then they, that's how they spend their day. And it was just a delight to see and to hear uh, the different kinds of storytelling because there's some some marvelous ones and then there were guests like uh, Diane Folkstein and mm -hmm. uh, who uh, is uh, you know she was a, a storyteller for the New York Public Library and used to go out in the, in the summer do a lot of storytelling in the Central mm -hmm. Park and other parks in New York uh, and there is a trend in storytelling now to to make it almost a thing that an actress or actor would do with uh, throwing the voice and very kind of elaborate. And it is rather wonderful to see and hear, but it is a little off-putting putting to the average librarian who has no pretension to being an actress, just loves the story mm -hmm. and wants to tell it. And he, I don't, he should keep his own courage and never feel that this is, in, is really superior to his way because his way often the story will get across and that's the important right. thing, uh, more than the more self-conscious telling. Mm -hmm. But there, in various places there are uh, these pockets of storytelling. Uh, I live in California now and there are many story hours for children. Uh, in bookstores, uh, all the bookstores have story hour corners with, you know, carpeted area with steps so that they can right. tell stories and have picture book hours for little children mm -hmm. for school classes that are brought in. And it's lovely, just right in the bookstores, mm -hmm. as well as, I mean, you could say, obviously, well, they'll sell some books, yes, but they, but they do it, so the children... Uh, Love to uh -huh. love to hear the stories and read the books, and uh, it isn't dying by any means. If they uh, if they don't tamper with the stories, there has been some good storytelling on television, but so often they can't let well enough alone, and they uh, monkey around too much mm -hmm. with it, and they don't realize that those stories that are handed down have a strength that just applying your head to it, oh, let's try this or let's try that, it could be good, but it often isn't. Do you mean the Walt Disney approach to storytelling? Well, that, I think, is... Uh, uh, I, I know it's very popular, and uh, something like Beauty and the Beast, which mm -hmm. was certainly an attractive, you know, show and film uh, for a lot of reasons, but you would like that child to go back and, you know, maybe Walter Crane's pictures to the, the Beauty and the Beast where the, the feeling, the feeling of, of terror mm -hmm. when she first sees this creature uh, is there. It's so much, it's so much more intense right. on the smaller, the smaller scale. Which leads into the question about the electronic future. Uh, so many people now are doing their publishing, their writing, in an electronic media. And you don't have what you have in your collection, which is the working drawings and that. If they have them, they've lost them because they've erased the disc and they've gone on to the next phase. And one of my concerns is how is the, the electronic explosion going to affect the picture book? Not only in the production of the picture book, but the actual use of picture books by children. They're so into the TV, the video. You know, what are your views on that? Well, my views are uh, maybe not too reliable because I haven't seen really enough of these. But, you know, the way Toy Story was done from mm -hmm. uh, manipulation through a computer of these images, you know, a, a brilliant use yes. of it. And things that, uh, for example, in E.T., when the children go off on the bicycles, you know, right. uh, 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 l really lovely moments. Right. And it can be used very poetically and very strongly, I think. It can be just monkeying around, too, and uh, destroying or distorting the very values. After all, these stories are full of very strong psychological values, mm -hmm. all kinds of things. And to just 
tamper with them cerebrally is not is not the answer. Mm -hmm. And that, uh, you know, a young friend of mine, a Dutch, a young Dutch artist who is in San Francisco and with a friend is doing this kind of thing, called up and asked me if he could use my books. And I, I said, uh, you, you, you know, it's up to you to do that with the publisher, with the rights person, the publisher, and find out about that. I don't mm -hmm. know whether they took the time to do that or not. But, uh, it's, it'll be the end of imagination eventually if everything is done for the child on paper and yeah. on film. Everything is spelled out uh, because from the book, there's always the life going on behind the pictures, behind the story that mm -hmm. goes on the continuity that goes maybe from one picture to another. And it's stimulating. But if you see every last thing, mm -hmm. uh, what more? I, uh, so I, I don't know what, yeah. what there is, uh, because with some of these things that worry us, eventually this pendulum swings just so far, and there's a backlash, and it comes right. down, and a lot of things that disturbed us. You remember how upset we were that there was going to be so much television that nobody would read anymore. Well, that isn't so mm -hmm. at all, really. Yes, we and were going to be a paperless society, and it has not worked yet. It hasn't worked yet, and, and I, never uh, will. there in California, I there are, I find many, many more bookstores mm -hmm. than there were in the Northeast, mm -hmm. and very, uh, many, many more children uh, coming uh, with parents to bookstores. Mm -hmm. So there's hope I was for the aware. future. Oh, I think so. Yes. <laughs> Which and there, why isn't there room for a lot of expressions? Right. Well, one of the things that was said yesterday when you were talking was about the, the brevity, the, the need to make every single word count in your artwork and every single drawing count and to get the message across, to get the story together. And with the TV, with the, the videos, it seems like they're overdoing. They're overwritten right. often. Right. And over, uh, there is such, such fancy illustration right. with so many details and a lot of them... Um, you know, not they don't really help the story forward. Some of them are atmospheric and maybe pleasant, but no, that uh, I th I feel that that kind of illustration that is so detailed, over realistic, eventually is uh, imagination thwarting too, mm -hmm. because a child doesn't have to bring any imagination to see to see the scene right. and that, and he should be able to, uh, you know. Well, when uh, you look at your why. when you look at your prince running down the staircase in Cinderella, you have the staircase, you have the prince, and you have a touch of it, a little castle. But that's it. The rest of it is all in your imagination. It's all in the you imagination of how how you know you feel. He's he's hurt and astonished that this lovely girl would leave so quickly and race mm -hmm. off into the night, and uh, and there leave him there. Uh, this <laughs> very sad and. Uh, <laughs> But the the uh, business of cutting down your words, uh, the thing is to do to find the uh, the verbs and the nouns that can convey convey your mood and your action of your story, especially mm -hmm. verbs, uh, rather than a general word. I had an ag argument with an editor once. For example, I wanted to say trudged, and she wanted to say walked. Mm -hmm. Well, if you're tired, you trudge because right. your feet are heavy and, you know, and that says so much more. And I said, why, God forbid that the child would learn another word. It's a nice <laughs> word. Why not let him learn it? Instead of, you know, she didn't believe in vocabularizing, but that's really what it was mm -hmm. if you use the general word. And you, all, the more specific, the more concrete, because that gives your mind and imagination something to hang right. on to. Right. And the otherwise, you're just, you know, fussing around in a, a sea of generalities. Mm -hmm. If you were facing a class of, or a group of individuals who wish to become authors and illustrators of children's picture books, and you had the opportunity to pass the wisdom along, what are the three things, the three most important Ooh, I, things three, that you would tell there, them? There, there probably are more than three things. There are probably things. 20. But uh, uh, I remember... Uh, Fritz Eichenberg, you know, wonderful printmaker mm -hmm. and artist uh, for children's books, had a class at uh, Pratt, 
and he said, Marsha, could I bring them up to your studio? Well, the studio, he didn't realize. It wasn't a very big room, and it was the only room I had, so mm -hmm. I did led to everything. I did have a, a couch here, and we couch there, and we had the chairs. It was just like a subway car, <laughs> and they <laughs> they came, and they were they were perfectly lovely kids, and we I showed them pictures and pictures in process and mm -hmm. so forth, and it was very nice. And they asked that same question of what you would, uh, what you would tell. I'd say, draw, endlessly draw, keep drawing all the time. Draw children, draw, draw, all your life draw. Um, if you're writing, acquaint yourself with good writing, the best if possible, and uh, keep it pared down, uh, mm -hmm. like uh, E.B. White and Strunk's little book on style. Right. Keep it pared down to very simple, clear, but vivid. Make every word count and every word, uh, that make a colorful word uh, convey your meaning. You can, mm -hmm. in one word, you can say what might have to be two sentences of explanation. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, uh, acquaint yourself with the best books of the past. These are not very original ideas, but I think they're important. So many people, uh, a lot of people, young people, even studying children's uh, literature, have no background. They don't realize that books were done before 1944. Uh, and it's uh, that's very uh -huh. sad, I think, because yes. they uh, there are places where you can find out about mm -hmm. them. There are plenty of books now, and if you can, if you're in a big city, there are exhibitions of old books, and they're mm -hmm. fascinating. I know in New York there were marvelous exhibitions there of things from the library right. collection or the Grolier Society, you know, had right. these things, and or the Met, you know, one of the most stimulating things is, you know, as Andre Malraux was uh, always saying that the masterpiece of uh, one artist will stimulate a lesser artist to do his, mm -hmm. to outdo himself. Uh, but I, I forget what I was going to say but about that, but uh, it's the business, oh, I was going to say the wonderful shows at the Museum of Modern Art and at the Metropolitan as the fine artist as illustrator, mm -hmm. because just as the world is full of hundreds of watercolorists mm -hmm. that can do very competent watercolors, uh, an artist that doesn't think of himself as a watercolorist, like Matisse, Bonnard, someone like that, will do the thing that is more perceptive, more beautiful, more feeling mm -hmm. than the so-called professional one. And that's, uh, this is very interesting because in Chinese art, in around 1400, this happened too, that the, the official artists who did the very, very detailed portraits and all of that kind of thing were very much revered, but it was the rather offbeat literati who were monks usually uh, doing their own thing and doing from their own feeling mm -hmm. that made the art advance, and, and are those are the ones that are really ten times more interesting now. But when you see these things that uh, Bonnard did for Verlaine's poetry, uh -huh. or those beautiful images that Matisse uh, did for um, Baudelaire, you know, the one for Brise Marine, and you know, it's, I can't even think of the things, but it's, oh, my you know, my soul, uh, you know, you're, you're bored, your life is just too, and you need to take to the sea, meaning to the, to the bigger world beyond, mm -hmm. and that lift of that, of that boat and the, the thing of going out to freedom, mm -hmm. it's so thrilling mm -hmm. that that kind of thing can affect you every time you're going to draw a ship, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, and you have to, uh, the strongest images possible, the strongest, uh, go to art shows, uh, Fine art shows, mm -hmm. not only illustration, that's interesting, but fine art shows will really thrill and astonish you and feed you. <laughs> that's wonderful. <laughs> yeah, really change you. Yeah. It's, there's I've so much to illustration. You know, you can, <laughs> ta you can, uh, you can work at it. Uh, you never come to the end of it. The possibilities are so endless because it, it does embrace all of life after all. Would you like to tell us something about your new adventure into Chinese calligraphy and uh, Japanese art? Uh, 
I'll, I'll tell something about it. I had always been interested in Chinese uh, painting, and I saw some very lovely shows at the Wildenstein Collection. And again, it was a collection of these artists that were not the very tight conventional ones. They were landscapists there about 1600, mm -hmm. and a beautiful, beautiful show. Helen Maston and I went to that show, and I still remember the uh, Mr. Wildenstein talking to us and telling that that he was able to get these, and that the uh, I think it was the curator of the Met then didn't even find so terribly interesting, but he he believed in them, and of course now the the Met has uh, revised and added and is a much better collection than it had then. Well. In 1979, my doctor, who was Chinese, lived in Ridgefield, Connecticut. Uh, I knew she was going to China, and I was very envious. Called up one night and said, there's a space on our tour. Uh, do either of you want to go? Janet said, go. Mm -hmm. And if you, if you <laughs> this chance will not come again. And it was a wonderful trip. We went with librarians, but they were curators of Chinese uh, collections all over Mm -hmm. Universities usually, right. or there was the wife of um, what is his name? His name is Fu Shen Fu, I think his name is, who is at the Freer Collection right. in Washington, and uh, Marilyn Fu. Her name was, and she and her husband have done the, the you know that marvelous big book from Princeton. There are images of the mind. You know mm -hmm. these these great uh, f fantastic landscapes that yeah. are akin to mental states. Uh, and it was a wonderful trip, a very, very exhausting trip, but marvelous, because we went, you know in China, if you go to see a mountain, you have to climb it. And they have these <laughs> granite steps up, and you were climbing forever. Well, I climbed and climbed and walked and walked, and I had 35 pounds of camera equipment. And I, now I have a lot of slides of China, but I also got shingles very badly and had to get thawed out. and. Uh, straightened out and I was paralyzed when I got home. Mm. Uh, but uh, I had seen in a library in Danbury some paintings by an Oriental Brush Artists Guild. Mm -hmm. So I called up the woman, and she was a very interesting woman whose husband uh, collected uh, beautiful hardwoods in Sumatra, um, Borneo, places, tropical woods that they use in very thin veneers and very mm -hmm. elegant uh, concert hall interiors and that kind of thing. And she lived there with him and lived in Hong Kong part mm -hmm. of the time and studied with uh, very good painters. And that foundation she gave those people and the kind of feeling for the philosophy of Chinese painting was such that that little organization, uh, there was a Dutch artist that came who she had been studying two years in Japan, mm -hmm. and that she and I worked, and we, the little, or she had to go back to Hong Kong to live, and the whole thing sagged. Well, we worked, and we got that little thing going again. And then <laughs> in 1985, the first group from University of, or the second group it is, from University of Minnesota at Duluth, mm -hmm. uh, went to study at Zhejiang Academy in Hangzhou. And the, that, these, this was a wonderful chance because you, uh, you studied there at the academy under these teachers, and the exposure to these benign, very, very sensitive, lovely teachers that happen to be all men, although they do have women on the staff. The teaching is never negative in any mm -hmm. aspect. It's always positive. Uh, oh, and that wonderful. was a kind of revelation because I've had teachers take the charcoal right out of your hand and say, no, do it this way. Mm -hmm. You know, never, never, never. So you are relaxed uh -huh. and you, you, do, you do so much more. Uh, wonderful, wonderful experience. And uh, so we were there. You had a chance to work with a calligrapher. And I found that with the, I had a, a kind of aptitude for uh, not only seal calligraphy, which you hold your brush upright and you conceal the point mm -hmm. so that it's rather broad strokes, very, very controlled. But if you can do that, you can control your brush so that then when you want to go wild with the brush on the cursive, you are you have the the control so that mm -hmm. you can do, you know, 
uh, it's more surely. And the whole thing, Chinese art is built up in opposites. For every strength, there's a weakness, you know, mm -hmm. a, a dark, a light, a, for in every possible way. And even making a calligraphic line, if you make a strong statement, you make uh, uh, you 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 thin the line. If you make it slowly, and then you make, mm -hmm. you know, very quickly, so that it's constantly this shift back and forth that makes for excitement mm -hmm. and interest. Well, I was just hooked. And uh, the next summer, I went to uh, Split Rock. Uh -huh. There, the Duluth uh, has this lovely summer uh, session where artists and people come from all over the country to teach there. And there were two Chinese artists from Zhejiang. He, one of them, would have been one of our teachers, but he was ill at the time. And I got to know them, and uh, they became friends. And I knew they were going to come east to do, uh, I had asked them to, if they could come and do a, a mm -hmm. workshop for our painting guild. And yes, they would. And I said, if they've got to have time to go to museums, you can't right. visit country and artist. And they did. Uh, and we had Marvelous Week in New York, and it was an mm -hmm. eye-opener to them. And I could do this in, in Boston and in Washington, right. D.C., so that they could see these wonderful collections. They saw calligraphy in Boston Museum mm -hmm. that was older than they'd ever had a chance to see in China. Oh, it wow. was a profoundly thrilling time oh. for them. And then when they went back, you know, they were changed. I mm -hmm. wish you could have seen the, heard the comments when uh, they saw the Rockefeller collection of primitive sculpture. They'd seen pictures, right. but the things oh moved them so. Mm -hmm. It was marvelous, and they were so grateful. They asked me to come back and uh, have private lessons in calligraphy and painting, and I did. It was two months, and the temperature here it's hot, uh, but it was one twenty-five some days, and high humidity. At Hangzhou is just a hot oven moist oven in the summer. Uh, but uh, it was marvelous. Every day after he'd finished, he, uh, 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 Jo was, uh, Jo Hejun, his mm -hmm. name is, uh, was teaching foreign students. And in the afternoon, he'd come to see me and what I'd done. And he'd go over it with me. He would bring his paintings, some of his best paintings. He'd trust you so, and he'd spread them out on the floor and in the corridor outside the kind of studio where I was working, uh, just for stimulus. So when mm -hmm. you walked by, you'd get this this wonderful thing all the time. And on the walls, uh -huh. uh, generous, generous, dear people. And uh, I worked my head off from the morning, uh, you know, in the afternoon. He'd say, OK, now five five more for tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And these were paintings of full sheets of paper that were 54 inches by maybe 30 inches. Huge. Uh, and five? <laughs> yes, but you did it, mm -hmm. you know, and big brushes, and you did it, and it loosened you up, and mm -hmm. it was such joy. You were exhausted, but it uh, I was a basket case when I finished this thing. <laughs> but uh, it... Uh, and then the next year, Janet and I brought him and his wife over. They stayed with, uh, with us and gave workshops. And we asked a few artists to come and work mm -hmm. in our studio with us, or in my studio. Okay. And uh, it was joy. And then we did the same for a very wonderful calligrapher, Wang Dongling. Mm -hmm. And it was one of the loveliest things. Uh, after uh, he went back home, he said, of all my time in, in America, the thing I remember most happily was those hours of working on the calligraphy in your studio and working on the paintings and feeling so free and the books, the, the library of the poetry we needed and the whole thing, every mm -hmm. thing was there. It, it was a great joy to me. That to was feel a nice that. tribute to you too. Well, you provided the opportunity. Yes, yes, but uh, but the the giving uh, his giving was so much more than anything I could give him, uh, and uh, I have a piece now in a show in China, an international show that he asked me to to put uh, something in, and uh, He Jun is going to come back to visit us this year, hmm. this fall, and he's going to stay about a month and a half with us. Well, that's wonderful. And he'll uh, he'll paint this. It's there. Uh, it's something that Americans uh, aren't able really to look at these mm -hmm. often 
I know of people who li think they like art, and I just pass them by. And then other people, I have an Italian friend who just stands bowled over by them and doesn't pretend to have any great ap background in art. Uh -huh. But it comes, something it comes out. It's wonderful. interesting, very interesting. What is fascinating to me is that you are constantly learning Oh yeah. constantly expanding your Well, craft. I'm studying with a young man now. And uh, this might sound odd, but you know, uh, you, you're, when you do landscapes, you can, you can be as amorphous as you wish with your clouds and so forth, some mm -hmm. your trees and things, but you need the contrast of line, vital line, mm -hmm. always with the atmospheric. And I've been working with this Steve Chen, who is from Zhejiang and mm -hmm. taught at the academy, and he married an American and came here. And out there in California, the Saddleback Community College has a wonderful arrangement with Leisure World that Leisure World lets them use the facilities mm -hmm. if they will teach their people at Leisure World for nothing. And other, but outside people come in mm -hmm. and pay tuition. And Steve's advanced class is always just hopping mm -hmm. because there are always so many people interested. And it's, uh, it's wonderful. This is interesting, and this ought to give us all courage because he did not specialize in landscape uh, painting as a student. He mm -hmm. specialized in bird and flower painting. Right. Well, that is interesting up to a point. But the landscapes are the really personal mm -hmm. things in which you can pour all your imagination and thing into. And he is approaching it, handling masses. You know there are the host, the guest, and then the, I don't know what this little thing is, sub-guest. And Cheng Ji Chi there from uh, Duluth, he used to call it Papa, Mama, and, and baby. baby in the rock <laughs> shapes and so forth. Mm -hmm. Well, he does through these masses and working on these masses and building up your landscapes that way and even appreciating the older historical landscapes and breaking them down so you can build your own. And I wish you could see what are done he's doing with people who uh, didn't really have a tremendous amount of talent or experience mm -hmm. with art. And they're all blossoming, <laughs> and it's uh, it's a kind of joy, uh -huh. a lovely, uh, lovely thing. It's wonderful. Yeah, so that that goes on, uh -huh. you know. <laughs> well, I do thank you for not only sharing your collections with us, but sharing your ideas with us about the history of children's picture books, the future of children's picture books, and the joy of art. Well, it's, it's the, the joy of art is, uh, you know, one young friend uh, that I, uh, he had been in the war, and uh, came back, he had no money whatsoever. He lived on about $10 a week. Uh, that included his room, and <gasps> you can imagine, mm -hmm. modest. And he, uh, he uh, but he did have GI Bill, mm -hmm. and he did it in the art courses at NYU. Uh -huh. And so he eventually got his degree so he could teach art and make some living while he was painting. And he said, it's the only thing you can do that you won't ever come to the end of. And uh, I, you know, I always think of that, and it's uh -huh. it's uh, it's not the only thing, but uh, it, you never do come to the end of it. It's that's what's so uh, you never feel you're even proficient in it. It's always ahead of you, and you're always trying every day. You're trying, and it's. Uh, but that doesn't mean because you're trying and not succeeding always that it's unpleasant. No, no, because you do succeed in little parts, mm -hmm. maybe. <laughs> Once in a while, you see. Once in a while. <laughs> also, you. you know what's nice? What? Sometimes you come upon things you've done earlier, and you didn't think they were so wonderful, but they weren't uh -huh. wonderful. But you, uh, you realize that they were better than you thought. Than you thought. I, coming from Findlay, from their, mm -hmm. their, their shadow wall, right. he said, wait till you see the shadow wall. Well, up above he had the canoe, you know, and mm -hmm. the heads and all of this realistic and then they got more and more stylized until down they were in these black shapes of the cut figures mm -hmm. and they all, it was all growing yeah. like that. Oh, wonderful yeah, yeah.